Welcome to this SEO Library webinar, More Than Just Genealogy, the Ancestry Library Edition. So I really started looking at these databases a little more in July when we added new databases to our collection. And Ancestry Library Edition we've had for a little while, but there are three, I call them children, of Ancestry and they are Fold3 and Heritage Quest and the African American Heritage databases that are new to us. And so I really started looking at them and they are just absolutely fascinating, the information that's there. And the reason I titled this more than just genealogy is because I found so much more information there not just you know some of my ancestors, but I've been able to find information about a city or the agriculture of a certain time period. Uh, one thing that I found when I was searching was that in 1880 in Noble County, Ohio, which is where I live, they had 1,115 beehives registered. And I'm a beekeeper, so that, of course, was really interesting to me. But I know now, uh, last year, there were 175 beehives. And then this year, there's less than 100 registered beehives within Noble County. So it was really just kind of an, an extra thing. It's not genealogical, but it's just historical information. So a little bit more about the Ancestry Library Edition. ProQuest who is a, a database company, has partnered with Ancestry.com to create the Ancestry Library Edition. It's one of the most important genealogical collections available today. It covers the United States and the United Kingdom, including census, church, court, and immigration records, as well as record collections from Canada, Europe, Australia, and other areas of the world. In the U.S. collections, there are hundreds of millions of names from sources such as the federal census, the birth, death, and marriage records, including the Social Security Death Index, and U.S. border crossing and trans-ocean ship records. The military collections contain more than 150 million records from the colonial to the Vietnam era, including World War I and World War II draft cards. I was able to find my grandfather's draft card, my great-grandfather's draft card. Uh, there are POW records, casualty records. There are multimedia collections that have pictures of gravestones, postcards, newsreels. I mean, the amount of information, it, it can be overwhelming, but there is just such a rich history in there. So how do we even get to the Ancestry Library Edition? Let me switch over here to our online catalog. And this is the quickest link that I have. I know some of you may have this link to Ancestry Library Edition on your web page, but if you go to the online catalog, you can scroll down and we have a new resources page where we've put links to all of these databases. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And you'll see that they're listed here. I'm going to scroll down to the Ancestry Library Edition. I have a couple other things that I want to share with you. They are links to a couple of, uh, there's a handout and a tutorial guide, a quick user guide. And let me go grab those links and put them in the chat box. Okay, so you guys could click on those, kind of save them, bookmark them, um, leave them open, and look at them maybe after the webinar. So I'm going to go back really quick to our PowerPoint because I want to talk to you about some of the features of the Ancestry Library. With the Ancestry Library, there are restrictions. You can only use it in the library or be on the public computer or using the Wi-Fi from the library. So it kind of, you know, you would think it would be kind of limiting, but one thing you can do is when you're researching, you can send links to yourself. 
email link, save a picture. It will collect those. I did three of them last night. <clears throat> and even in the, my previous searches, it keeps those. It sent me a link today, and I was able to open up each one of those documents. I can do that from home then. I don't have to be back in the library to open up my research. So while we're doing our searching in Ancestry Library, you'll see this box where it says, Send Your Find Home. And you can send document. And what comes up next is a box where you'll enter in your email. And then notice there in the middle it says, Note that if your record spans several images, you must send an email for each image. And this can be done using the Save button on the Image Viewer page. So if you're actually in looking at an actual picture from the 1850 census, in the top right corner there will be a green button there that says Save. And then you can actually send that picture, send that link to yourself in an email. So in my email, it, it'll come up from ancestry at email.ancestry.com. In the middle of the email, it'll say view your discoveries. And you'll click that. And it will open up a page with the links that you saved. So I could either download the image uh, where it says here for Joseph Morrison. Uh, it'll open up a printer-friendly text. The download image would actually download that, that image to my computer. I'll keep monitoring the chat, so if you have a question, just go ahead and put it in. All right, well, we're going to go back to Ancestry. Okay, and this is the home page. If you wanted to just dive right in and start searching, you could click the Begin Searching button right in the middle. And then they have what they've described, some different types of searching. I'm going to go ahead and click the Begin Searching button so I can just show you a little bit more about these. So right here in the search, the first search box, that's really like your basic search. It's not exact. It's kind of a broad search, and it's going to search all the different collections. Advanced search is if you click and you start including some more options. Do I want to match all my terms exactly? Do I want to add maybe I know the year that they died? Exact searching is good because it can help you limit your results, but it can also narrow it too much because if a record doesn't contain all of the information you've indicated, it won't bring it back. There's no really fuzzy searching. It's, it's searching you know, character for character when you do the advanced. Okay, let me go back to the home page. So if you do the basic search there, it is going to search all of the different collections. But you can search specific collections. So if I scroll down just a little here, you can see that we could search just in the census records or the vital records collection, the military or immigration. And then they also have the quick links down here on the bottom. And we're going to look at those here again um, in a little bit. The other method that you can use to search, if I click on Begin Searching again, is to explore by location here in the middle. Ancestry offers an intuitive new Explore by Location feature, and this enhancement allows you to quickly access records by the geographic location. It's easier than ever to focus on records that are relevant to a place your ancestor may have lived. So I can click on Ohio, and if I hover over it, you can see there it says that there are 484 different collections. And so I'll click on Ohio, and then over on the right, you can see the collections attributed to Ohio there. 
There's the Quaker meeting records, Ohio death records, tax records, city directories. I was really interested in city directories. Here is a listing. Let me see if I can make our print a little bigger. The Ohio and Florida city directories. Well, what are city directories? Yeah, they're kind of like a phone book in a way. But they list a lot more information than that. The city directories cover uh, the private residence, their profession, as well as their place of business or where they worked. They are searchable by name and year. They may have other locations nearby, like you choose the state and then you'll choose the city. And the one that I'm going to show you is Cambridge, but it also includes Byesville, which is a, another little town very close to Cambridge and Guernsey County. A lot of the entries also include their personal street address, whether or not they rent or own their home, their marital status. Okay. And it'll include the spousal reference. I mean, so maybe it'll say they're married, but it also includes their spouse's name. All right, so I could search within the city directories. I could put a last name in. I kind of like to browse them. So I'm going to browse this collection, which is over on the right. I'm going to use the drop down and I'm going to choose Ohio. And then it'll ask me to choose a city. And I'm going to pick Cambridge. And then the year. We're going to look at 1930. Now, just um, to give you a little bit of explanation of what we can see on this page, over on the right, the far right, you'll see that there are some tools here. The first one is for full screen. The second one is a source menu. And if I click that, it's going to open up as telling me where it's coming from that I'm looking in the Ohio and Florida city directories. The one below that are additional tools. And if I click it, I can print, download, flip the images if I needed to, and report any problems. And then you'll have the zoom and fade slide bar there. So I'm going to go ahead and move my menu back over. So a little bit about two on this page is down at the bottom, you actually get the entire collection as it is, say, on the film strip. And I can go back and forth by clicking in the middle of the page where it tells me I'm on page number one of 156 and there is my film strip icon and if I want it to not show so that I can see more of the workspace I just click it and I can always bring it back by clicking it again so I'm gonna forward to page six of this and I can do that by actually just clicking down in the bottom of the page and putting a six in there. So I'm going to page six of 106 or 156 and I click go. And here's the title page that I found uh, on the right. So it's the 1930 Cambridge, Ohio directory. You can see who compiled and published it. And then to help us understand what we're seeing here, I'm going to skip over to page 8. Now, when I'm talking about page 8, I mean page 8 of the film strip or the collection. If we scroll up here a little bit, you can see this is actually page 14 and 15 of the original directory. Now, what I thought was so interesting, and I even had to look some of these up because I didn't understand what they meant um, are the abbreviations used in this book and yes I am going to zoom in on that so why is this important 
what kind of historical value does this have? Well, to me, when I look at this, I can see what kind of industry was in this area in the 1930s, what kind of jobs there were, and how that may differ from today. So the ones that really jumped out at me that I thought we won't see as much today in today's phone book, um, I don't even keep the phone book that I get today. I kind of throw it away. They had jobs listed here such as blacksmith, a brakeman. There's the blacksmith and the brakeman. A cigar maker, a cigar packer, a cutter, dressmaker, a milliner, a linotype operator, and a paper hanger. They also have abbreviations, you know, if the person was a member of the United States Army or the United States Navy. And then it also gives you abbreviations for proper names. Okay, so I'm going to skip um, over to page 9 and show you one way that information is listed here. Okay, let me zoom out just a little so we can get our bearings. Now, what they did with these is they didn't list it first by uh, last name. They offered it by street, and this is the street guide. So this was amazing to me because on Beatty Avenue in Cambridge, 918 Beatty Avenue, lived Homer St. Clair. So if, if you lived in Cambridge, and uh, I know that the public library in Cambridge is 800 Steubenville Avenue, and I was curious if they were there in that location in 1930. So I looked up the listing for Steubenville Avenue, and I found it on page 29. And there it is, the Cambridge Public Library. It has a line there, but it's 800. That's where it starts. And that is listed under Steubenville Avenue. You see the index, the listing there over on the left. Another thing that I really found interesting here was on page 100. And this is where they would list the residents by last name and then you would have their first name and their occupation. So we have a bookkeeper, we have an operator. Mary Nugent was an operator for the Ohio Bell Telephone Company. Guy Nutter and his wife Esther. Um, he was vice president of the Greeton Company. And their home was 301 Clark Street. Then we can go to page 131 and we can see the actual business directory, which is like our yellow pages now. And I really liked what it said here because they're really trying to sell the advertising. Every store should be listed in the directory and the directory in every store. Besides its use to the keepers of the store, it is a convenience customers look for. The store that offers an old or no city directory does not show its patrons a courtesy. They will find elsewhere. But then it's divided by the type of business, whether they're welders or automotive, uh, automobile repairers, Also, again, it just really was amazing to me to see the different occupations. And 
you can see there were more bakers than bankers and definitely more barbers than banks. Look at all those barbers here on the right and billiards and pool. If anybody wanted to play pool, they could know where they wanted to go do it. All right. Um, I love the city directories for these. Not all cities had these. I'm not sure exactly what the criteria was for the population. I have not been able to find one for my small town in Caldwell, but even if you don't, there's still a wealth of information that you could get from these. Okay, I'm going to go back to the home page of Ancestry Library. And I just wanted to show you a little bit more of what's available here. They do have, um, across the top, I'm looking at the menu, and there's the search that we kind of looked at. They also have message boards where you could go and leave a message if you are trying to find a certain person or some family history. The Learning Center also offers some really good research aids and tutorials. Really nice links. Ancestry Library and Ancestry.com actually have a YouTube channel and there's a lot of good information there. On charts and forms, you can download blank sheets. Like here's one that's your family tree that you could download and help you record your research. The next one is New Collections, and it contains the card catalog, which is a searchable listing of all the, the record collections, and you can filter it by your facets over here on the left. So another thing that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to show you about Ancestry is on the home page. And I'm going to scroll down here to um, search the census. So I'm going to click Search Now. Now I could put in my search if I know the exact name, but as I said, I like to browse. So I'm going to scroll down, and you'll see this is the information that's included in this census collection. And what I found was really interesting was the 1850 federal census slave schedules. One of the forms that we uh, that Ancestry offers, let me go back up here, I want to show it to you, charts and forms, oh, where did it go, census forms, and slave schedule. Of course, this is new, but this is what they were asking for. back during the 1850 census. So you had listed the name of the slave owner, the number of slaves, the age, the sex, the color, whether or not they were a fugitive from the state, and number of manumitted slaves. And I had to look that up because I didn't know what it was. And manumitted takes place when the masters free their slaves voluntarily. Emancipation is the process of freeing the slaves through a government action, and we know abolition is when the government ended slave slavery completely. But this, with this census, would list and mark off if they were a slave but they had been freed by the slave owner. It also has a column for deaf and dumb, blind, insane, or idiotic. I'm going to jump back to our census page because I actually wanted to bring one of those up. Slave schedule, 1850 slave schedule. Okay, now um, I could browse this collection over on the right. Another thing that you can do is you could put a letter in like say for the last name and just hit enter and it'll give you a search uh, result and then I could click and start browsing from there. So this first one 
um, we'll click on it. It's a female black, age 50, from Lawrence, South Carolina. And when we click here, we want to see the actual document. I can click View. And again, you'll see at the bottom, this is part of uh, a reel. And so I can forward and go backwards and, and just browse through here. Now, sometimes the writing is a little easier to read. This was the Lawrence District of South Carolina, and it was recorded the second day of October in 1850. And it'll list the slave owner, and it'll say number of slaves, like one, but actually it has that person's name and then all of the slaves that they owned at the time, and the age and the sex and their color. Now, in my uh, searching, I didn't do a lot of browsing through this collection, but I did not see anybody who had been freed by their owner or master, I should say. And I didn't really see any uh, that were marked under the last column either. But it's, it's just really kind of fascinating information that we can gather from this documentation. Another thing that uh, Ancestry Library offers that you may not think of as genealogy really is they're starting to get a lot of yearbooks, high school yearbooks that have been scanned and are available for you to look through. So not just genealogy. So one more thing to think about before we go, and this was from one of the tutorials that I looked at for Ancestry. And it, it was five things you should do with every record that you see. Number one, source the record. Where exactly is this information coming from? The one that we have in front of us right now we know is from the 1850 federal census for the slave schedules. And we can see a lot of times the transcribed version, but we get a lot of information from looking at the image and not just the transcribed index. List all the points of genealogical importance. So if you are doing a genealogy, maybe figure out, well, was this someone's mother, someone's father? Where did they fit in my tree? And then what further questions are you getting from this? Like my one question here was number of manumitted, and I had to look that up to see what that meant. And then number five, file your notes and the image. So you may want to save this so that we can find them again later. Because once you start digging in here, you're going to get in and you're going to find something really awesome and you're going to not be able to get back to it. There are just millions of records here. So um, I really am really enjoying this and I hope you guys did too. We have another class on Tuesday at 10 a.m. And it is over the Fold 3, the military database. Thank you guys for coming and joining us as we learn how we can use the Ancestry Library Edition for more than just genealogy. Someone asked, can a family tree be made with this database? No. That is one thing that we lose when we get the library subscription. We can only do family trees and create them if we have a paid, a personal paid Ancestry.com account. Do I know of any free sites that offer that service? I do. i got to think of the name. FamilySearch.org. You can create a free account here, and you can create your family tree. This is an amazing website. Um, one of my coworkers told me about it. The, the most amazing thing about this, this is also another Church of Latter-day Saints uh, group that funds this.
the research is extensive. I just really had to put in my name and maybe my parents' name, and boom, 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 boom. The other family trees kind of melded into mine, and I was able to just click, and, and I'd go to my grandparents, and then I would go to their parents, and then their parents. I was able to go clear back to the 1500s. Now, I don't know how exact and correct it is. I would have to actually really start doing some digging. But it was a great place for me to start. It went back, and it also told uh, where they were born. So I, according to this familysearch.org, I have relatives from Sweden and I think some Norway and some France when mostly all I ever knew was England and Ireland. So you guys might want to give this one a, a some of your interest also. Well, as I said, you guys um, know how to contact me here at SEO. And I hope you guys have a great day and thank you for joining us.